Kristen, mm-hmm. can I interrupt for one second? Just yeah, to go on what she was saying, Chantel, the woman, Mariah, who was trying to log in, she can't get back on, mm-hmm. but she messaged me and she was hoping that you could answer a question for her here. And it's sort of related to your son's teacher kind of helping you out with this. So I figured I'd just interject. Mm-hmm. Um, she's just asking, how aggressive do you have to be with the school in terms of getting help and ensuring that your child gets what he or she needs um, for their diagnosis? And sh- she's yet to have a 504 four plan in place. And she was wondering if I could ask the other mothers here um, if they have that in place for their children. Yeah, let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, Yeah, so um, we can talk about that um, based on this stuff. And so Chantel, what, what has been your experience in terms of getting supports and services for Liam? So he's um, he's 12. So, so I was saying we- Liam was about two months into grade one when he was diagnosed. Um, and I literally, and we were transitioning schools at that time. So I literally walked into the school one week after receiving that diagnosis and said, we're moving to your school and handing them the whole report. Yeah. Um, so grade one was definitely a rocky year, our first year out, because there's no manual for a parent telling them what they need to do when their child receives these significant diagnosis. Um, and mm-hmm. I found for myself, it took two years for me to feel comfortable, like I built the team. Yeah. Um, but having that school relationship is one of the things I personally feel is the most important a thing a parent can do is building that really positive relationship, recognizing that the teachers are there that and the support staff that are there are doing the best they can to what they have available to them and to support them through that and recognize that they're human beings that are going to be a really, really big part of your child's life for years to come. Um, now here in Canada, well, here in British Columbia, I'll say, um, we, we work together to build what's called an IEP, an individualized education plan. Yeah. So at the start of every year, I have a meeting with the learning resource teacher who oversees all the supports for Liam. Mm-hmm. Um, his teacher for the year will come in. Sometimes a teacher from the year past will come in. Um, any EAs that are going to be working with him sometimes will come in. I really do enjoy that. And I also have a privately funded occupational therapist that is allowed to work in the school with Liam once a week and she comes into those meetings so I gather us all together yeah um I've had his behavioral consultant sit in on those meetings as well and that allows all the brains that know Liam to be in one room and talk about what we're best going to set up for him what are our goals for this year what are Liam's struggles most prevalent at this point in time how do we want to support him socially how do we want to support him academically what adaptations do we need in place um I think I heard part of Mariah's question was like, how, how much do you need to fight for that? How much do you need to push for it? And I always say you advocate, you advocate, 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 and you never stop advocating so long as you're taking it in a really positive approach. We need to remember not to get mad at the individuals who maybe aren't bending to exactly what we need or flexing for exactly what we need for a kid because they are restrained by what they're offered to use too. But advocating is the best thing you can do for your kid, 100%. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think what I would communicate, what I would communicate to Mariah is just, I think each um, state as well as a lot of kind of national organizations and, and likely international organizations are really there to support parents mm-hmm. and to help with this advocacy because the process of advocacy can be really, really tricky. Um, I do, I totally, Chantal, I, I totally agree with what you said. I think a strong working relationship and a really close collaboration with the school district is only going to serve in everyone's best interest. Um, Sometimes in that process of advocacy, that relationship can get a little bit strained Mm -hmm. and that can be really challenging for, for the parent, uh, you know, trickles down to the, to the child as well. Um, And so it's helpful to kind of build, I think, you know, if I can, go back you know this is really um i don't know if it's cut off the the subtitle but this is really just a very simple slide um slide but i call it like the spheres of support right and so none of these individual bubbles can kind of stand alone um the school and the community providers and the home providers you know the the parent the family um the whole school team and then the community, you know, what is meant by that is really, again, the medical team. Um, Chantel, if it's okay that I share this, but, but you know, given Liam's um, medical profile, I think obviously him having really strong 
um, a really strong medical team in place has been critical. And we know autism is a whole body disorder, right? So um, it's really important to have, you know, like you said, every all the kind of brains all together mm -hmm. under one roof. Um, I think that is in, in certain areas of the country, that is the piece that is often so challenging is, is what we consider care collaboration. Um, a lot of times there's these really kind of distinct providers all talking different languages and providing kind of really discrete services that might be individually beneficial, um, but they're not communicating. And so, you know, a lot of times all of these symptoms and all of these treatment plans kind of um, can have the potential to kind of contradict each other. And so it's really helpful to kind of, you know, if I can communicate anything to, to both of you about this process, it would just be collaboration, 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 and how helpful that is. And how hopefully your, your teams that you're dealing with um, are really motivated to do that. Um, here, I'm at the Lori Center, which is an out, it's Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. It's their outpatient autism clinic. Um, and we're one of the only out, autism clinics in the country and actually the world that really has a multidisciplinary team on site that sees individuals through the lifetime. And so um, I think it's really important, I think coming from that perspective to, to really communicate how closely I do work with you know, the developmental behavioral pediatricians, the neurologists, the GI doctors, um, you know, the, you know, the psychiatrist to all kind of work together on eat on care collaboration. Um, and that goes would school pay too. to have that all under one. <laughs> the fact that, I mean, we have a great pediatrician that is, she's my center hub. She knows us. She's been there from day one yep. with Liam. So she refers us out to all the right places and it's, she is, she is my backbone. She's one of my backbones. Center hub. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. But I'm going in different directions when we went to get a neurologist for his seizures, when we had to go see a GI specialist for his rumination disorder. You know, it's it's all different directions rather than having one central hub that kind of works together. I am the one that kind of is the backbone holding all the pieces together of yeah. the different collaborators on this with the support of his pediatrician. So totally. totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I feel very grateful to work here. I think mm -hmm. it's 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 a shame that most um most clinics don't function like this mm -hmm. for sure and you know i i've been here now for like seven or eight years so i've i've done these reevaluations of of children and now they're at transition age and i've seen them all the way through for neuropsychological evaluations at, at you know every two years or at various time points um and because of that dedication to serving our patients throughout the lifespan, we're really able to follow them developmentally over time, which I, most autism clinics just do, you know, three-year-old evals, and then they kind of send you on your way with a whole book of recommendations where we're really able to manage that over time. 